Welcome back, everyone. Dan Vega here. And today we're talking about Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG for short, in your Java applications. Now, why does this become important? Well, a lot of the business applications that we're building are built on this technology, and it really starts to make for a lot of interesting, intelligent applications. And why does RAG matter? Why does it matter to us? When we talk about large language models, it has a lot of limitations, some of those which are it's only trained on a certain set of data up to a certain point. So if we want to provide it with the most relevant information, we need to provide that context. Also, these large language models are not trained on your data, hopefully. So in the case of, hey, I have this privacy policy or this cancellation policy, and I want to feed this to the LLM as part of the context, uh, now we can do so. Also, when the LLM does not have the appropriate information, it can sometimes hallucinate. And the more information we can provide it, the better context it has, the less likely it will be to hallucinate. So those are some of the things that we're gonna talk about today. And I want to go through some kind of concepts. We'll talk about tokens. We'll talk about why RAG matters, what is RAG, and more importantly, what is not. Because I see a lot out there that RAG is just kind of feeding all your documents to an LLM, and that, that's not particularly true. So we'll do that, we'll talk about some concepts, and then we'll go in and we'll build an actual application in Java using Spring AI. This makes it incredibly easy to do RAG in your applications, and we'll, we'll show that through a demo today. So I think this is a really good place to start. I've kind of put together a graphic on some of the things we're gonna talk about today. I'll go ahead and export this as a PNG, and I'll drop it in the GitHub repository for all the code that we're gonna go through today. You can find all of that down below in the description. So first, starting off, tokens are the currency of LMs. And this becomes very important. This is how we pay for each of the requests and responses that we're doing. But what is a token? Uh, there are some really good tokenizers out there. Uh, this one is from uh, OpenAI. And what it lets you do is input some text and see roughly how many tokens it is. So I just put some text in there and it says, hey, this is 439 characters, roughly 95 tokens. And if you look down at the bottom, it says this translates to roughly three fourths of a word. So 100 tokens are 100 tokens equals 75 ish words. And again, it's not always a word. You can see by the color coding how it kind of breaks it down. Again, this is important because this is how we are going to pay for this. This is the cost of doing business when it comes to generative AI. So this is OpenAI's pricing. If you go to any of the other large language models out there, you'll find similar pricing models. Uh, but for each of the different models out there, uh, you'll see for GPT-40, $2.50 for 1 million input tokens and uh, $10 for 1 million output tokens. So the input is the request, the output is the response. Now different models have different pricing and you can see that here. So what that means is we have to be cognizant of what we are sending to the LM. We can't just send everything we have because it's going to end up costing a lot of money, especially if you have a high throughput application, right? The other part of this is that every LLM has a context window size. This means that you can't just send the entire internet in a request because it has a max size that you can send. So if we look at GPT-4, 32,768 tokens. Claude 3 is at 200,000 tokens. And if you use Gemini, it has 1 million tokens. And if you jump up to their pro level, it has a 2 million context size window, which is really large. One of the, I think, the biggest out there. So price and context window become very important when we're building these generative AI applications. So let's talk about why RAG matters. We mentioned a few of these earlier. Large language models are trained on data up to a certain date. So you can go in and ask, uh, say, ChatGPT, what is the cutoff date for your training data? And it will tell you. So if you're ever curious of what those dates are, go ahead and ask the LLM and it will kind of output that for you. So that means anything after that date, it doesn't have knowledge of. And if you are asking, if you're in the realm of uh, asking it certain types of questions that it may not have answers to, you may want to be able to provide some more context. Again, it's not trained on your data, hopefully, uh, your private documents, your internal documentation. If you want to provide that as context, uh, we can go ahead and do that with RAG. 
And again, if we don't have up-to-date information, this is the likelihood where we're going to get more hallucinations. Uh, we're going to get responses that aren't factually correct. The more context we can provide, the better. So what is RAG? RAG stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. Uh, combines retrieval-based methods with generative models to produce more accurate and contextually relevant outputs. Uh, this allows LLMs to access external knowledge sources, mitigating limitations like outdated information or knowledge cutoff. So that's RAG. What is not RAG, and I think this is very important to understand as too, is just sending all of our documents in the context of each request. That does not equate to RAG. Uh, that is providing extra information, but not RAG. If you want to summarize an entire document, this makes sense, but it's not RAG. And again, this is important because of those context window limits. So let's look at an example of this. In this first one, I have a user uh, query here, and I'm saying, please summarize all of these documents and then give me five key takeaways. So when we do that, we add all of the documents to our request, send it off to the LLM, and it will give us back whatever that summarization, those five key takeaways are. That's great, that works, not RAG. Here's another one. I have a user query and I say, what is the current state of the economy? Maybe we have a bunch of documents that we've uploaded or added to the context here. In this case, it doesn't make a lot of sense to send all of those documents because we're asking a very specific inquiry about something that may be hidden all the way down in a particular document, right? So in that case, we don't want to send all of the documents. We only want to send the bits that are relevant to answering that question to the LM. So um, we could do that, but uh, again, if we're sending all of our documents, that's not RAG, right? We're not sending just the bits. We need to send what's relevant to the query, and that's where RAG comes in. So RAG, we have two phases. One is the ingestion phase, and that is loading a vector database with all of our relevant documents or information. The way this happens is we take all of our documents and we have these document readers. So with Spring AI, we have a bunch of document readers. We'll see them in the, the Spring Initializer later. But this can handle PDFs, Markdown, document, uh, Word docs, uh, Excel sheets, whatever our documents are in the form of, we can take those document readers and hand them off to an embedding model. Now an embedding model's job is to take that information and turn it into vectors that can be stored in a vector database. These vectors are mathematical computations, and this allows for much quicker searches over the vector database for relevant information. So we're not storing this data in a traditional relational database. We're storing it in a specialized database called a vector database. And we'll talk more about that as we go. So that's phase one. This isn't done every single time. This may be done once. This may be done on some scheduled uh, task where every day or week or month you need to update the vector database with relevant information. Uh, but this is really done in two phases. The ingestion phase, once that's done, now we can use this in our application. So here I have another request. I am a user. I perform a user query, uh, some type of search here or some type of question. And what happens is we have this context retrieval and we say, hey, based on the user query, let's go off to the vector database and pull out just the bits from the document that are relevant to this query. So again, we're not sending all the documents to the, um, we're sending just the bits that are, that are needed to answer this particular query. And again, that's important. Remember, we looked at tokens. Uh, we, do, we, we have a context window size. We are paying for this. So we don't want to just send everything. We are sending just the relevant bits. So now we have this augmented prompt with our user query and any uh, information that is relevant to this query, and we're sending that off to the LM. Once it has that, it can go ahead and generate its response and return back to us. So I think um, that's kind of my overview of, of what we're going to talk about today. And I just want to show this off a little bit more uh, in, in case you go off and you try to do a search on something like ChatGPT, um, why this matters. So I'm going to choose GPT-40 here. And I'm going to say, what is the current stock price 
of AVGO, which is Broadcom, the company I work for. I'm gonna copy that because we're gonna do it again. See this searching up here. So it's actually searching. Um, and it was able to go out and give me the current um, stock price. It did that because it was able to go out and search the web uh, at real time. But remember, this is the product that sits on top of the large language models. ChatGPT is a product. GPT-4.0 is the large language model. So this is adding that extra functionality in there. If we're using GPT-4.0 in our applications, we don't have that ability to go search the web. And I'll show this off. So this is the product, but you can also go into uh, OpenAI's Playground and test the different models here. And this you can get a little bit uh, more fine-tuned with. You can like pick a model, you can like adjust the temperature and the length and, and how we return those results. But I'm just gonna paste in what I did before and run this. And you're gonna see, I don't know, I don't have access to real-time data. So the same way that if I were to ask this a question about something that happened last month, its training data is not trained on that. So it's not gonna know that. So it's either gonna say, I don't know, or it's gonna hallucinate something and probably not give you back uh, the right answer. So again, I'll go into something like Google Gemini. And as you can see over here in the AI studio, uh, I have this token count of 1 million. So I'm only using up 10 tokens here. This, this can take up to a million tokens. But again, this is gonna have the same problem it does not have access to real-time or updated information, right? And um, another one here, I can go in and Claude and ask the same thing, and it doesn't know the current stock price uh, of that particular stock ticker, right? So uh, that's just a little bit about uh, some of the limitations of LLMs and why RAG matters when it comes to building out intelligent applications for a lot of the business use cases that we're seeing with some of our customers. So we're gonna build out a quick RAG example today and I'm gonna show you just how easy it is to do in Spring AI. So the best way to do this is to get started. Uh, head over to start.spring.io. We're gonna create a new Java project with Maven using the latest version of Spring Boot. I'm gonna say this is dev.danvega and we'll call this a RAG demo. I'm using JDK 23. And then we're gonna fill in dependencies here. So I'm gonna build out a web app, which means I can just go ahead and when I go ahead and release this out somewhere, I can hit this using like a REST endpoint. I can provide a request and get a response back. And then we need to configure our LLM, our large language model. Uh, Spring AI has access to all the popular large language models out there and you just gotta go in and pick which one you're going to use. So in this case, uh, I'll use OpenAI as the LLM. Now remember, I talked about those document readers earlier. Like how are we going to get our documents into a vector database? So if we look through document reader, we can see that the Spring Initializer now has the document readers as starters, so you can pick from them. And it really depends on what documents you're trying to read from. So the Tika document reader has access to PDFs, Doc, DocX, PowerPoints, and HTML. There's a Markdown document reader, and there's a PDF document reader. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose the PDF document reader. Next, we need a vector database. Uh, so Spring AI has support for all, a lot of the, the vector databases out there. You can see this large list. There's a lot of really great ones in here. I'm gonna choose the PG vector database. Um, I'm a big fan of Postgres. This is their kind of vector offering um, on that side. Now, I could go ahead and set up a PG vector database on my local machine, and then anytime I need to use it, I can just use that one. I wanna make this easy for me and for you, so when you're downloading the source code, you don't have to go through and set that vector database up, and we're gonna do that by using Docker. So we have Docker Compose support, so if you click the Docker Compose support, it will look at your other dependencies here and decide, okay, what containers do I need to set up for this service? And so if we look at Explore here and we go in here and we look at the compose.yaml, you see that it's setting up an image for PG vector. And we can configure this later, uh, but this will give us a vector database when we run our application without having to do any of that setup, which I love. So with that, we have everything we need to build our application. 
Uh, you can go ahead and click Generate. This will download a zip file. You can open it up in whatever text editor or IDE you're most productive in. I'm going to go ahead and open that up in IntelliJ's Ultimate Edition. And with that, I think we have everything we need. What are we waiting for? Let's write some code. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is open up our compose.yaml here. I'm going to change a couple things about this. Let's go ahead and say that the database is going to be called Markets. Uh, we're dealing with some financial information that we're going to add to the context here. Uh, I'll go ahead and say my password is password, and then my user is user. Also go ahead and make sure that port 5432 maps to 5432. If you don't do this, it'll just add a dynamic port, and then you have to look at Docker and try to figure out which port it's running on. If you want to look at the database, this way we know uh, it's on that specific port. So with that, um, we want to go ahead and set some properties. So let's go into source, main, Java. Actually, I want to rename this just because I like this called application. Uh, I don't know. I'm just weird like that, but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, we all have our quirks, right? So I'm going to go into uh, application.properties, and we're going to set a few things. So we're talking to OpenAI's GPT-40, or we're going to, and we need to configure that. So no matter what LLM you're talking to, you have a couple of properties that you want to set. Uh, I want to go ahead and set my API key equal to um, the actual API key. Now I've done some videos on this if you want to figure out how to get uh, an API key from a particular um, large language model, in this case OpenAI, uh, you can go to their um, uh, platform and get that. I'm not going to hard code this in here. I'm going to use an environment variable. In this case, I've set one up called OpenAI API key. And then I want to go ahead and set the chat model. This is just specifying which uh, LLM model you're going to talk to. In this case, I'm talking to GPT-40. Now, if we were to go ahead and run this application, the schema for the vector database would not get initialized. This doesn't happen by default. And that's just in case like you have your own vector database set up already and we don't want to you know, initialize it, then we won't. But in this case, I want to. So I'll say spring AI vector store PG vector initialize schema. Uh, I'm going to say true. All right. Uh, so with that, um, we are in a good place. Now I'm going to copy over a PDF. I want to show you the PDF that we're going to use. So I'm going to put this in a directory called docs. And I actually just went out and did a search for kind of current uh, economic papers out there. This one came from Morgan Stanley. So this is publicly available, but just as of last month, but not trained by the different LMs. So I'll go ahead and open this up in Finder. And then I'll go ahead and open this document. And it looks something like this. Uh, just again, from Morgan Stanley, the bead has a bunch of information on kind of the current state of the economy. And we can go ahead and ask some questions uh, to Generative AI about this uh, particular document. So I have my document. I have my connection to um, OpenAI's GPT-40 in place. Uh, the first thing that we'll want to do is kind of set up that ingestion phase, right? Like we need to get this document into a vector database, into this PG vector database here. Uh, let's make sure Docker desktop is running. So Docker, that should be running. And there it is. I have a couple other things I want to make sure that are not running. Um, and this is a previous one, so let me delete that. So with that, uh, I think we can go ahead and try and just... All right, so let's go ahead and run the application. Uh, we see some containers started. The application has started. So what should happen is because we are initializing the schema here, we should be able to connect to that database and see it. So I'm going to go ahead and connect to um, Postgres. Now, if you're using something other than IntelliJ Ultimate, that's okay. Any database tool that you use to connect to a database should work. Uh, the user, I believe, was user. Password was password. Uh, the database, uh, let's see what that was called again. So we're calling this markets. Uh, so let's say data source, Postgres, user, password. Um, sure. 
and then we'll call this markets. Let's go ahead and test that connection. And that looks good, so I'll click OK. Now we see that database there. If I go into public and go into tables, we have a vector store table. So this contains all the information we need, like the embeddings and stuff, but again, nothing's in the database yet. So that goes back to our ingestion phase. We gotta take our documents, so in this case, our single PDF, we gotta use the embedding model and store those vectors into the vector database. So how do we do that? So we're gonna create a new class here. We're gonna call this the uh, ingestion service, service stand, and this is going to be a class, and this is going to implement the command line runner. So this happens uh, right after the application context gets created, and then we'll go ahead and implement that run method. Let's go ahead and make this a component, and we'll need a couple things in here. I'm gonna get a logger, so let me say logger, and let's import that. That looks good. Uh, we need another import there. This used to automatically happen, and now uh, it hasn't been lately. I don't know what's going on. So, um, did I pull, oh, I pulled in the wrong one. This is the one I want, okay. So now that I got a logger, I'll use that in a second, but I also need a vector store. So private final vector store, vector store, and we will get that through constructor injection. Now this comes in because we have PG vector store on the class path, auto configuration kicks in, and a bean of type vector store is wired up. Now this is an interface, there are some implementations of it, but in our case there is a PG vector store and this contains all the information it needs to, all the methods to talk to a PG vector store. So we get an instance of that vector store in. We can use that in just a second. One more thing we'll need is a reference to this PDF that we're going to use and ingest into the PG vector store. So I'm gonna use uh, the at value annotation and say that this is going to be uh, under the class path, under uh, slash docs slash uh, article underscore the beat October 2024.pdf. So that's our article and we'll say resource, resource. So that's our resource. Um, let's call this something better. How about market PDF, right? So now in this run method, this is going to get run when the application starts off. We wanna go ahead and re get that PDF and we want to read in the PDF and then use something to split the document up into different pieces. Because again, we're not storing the entire document, we're in storing pieces of the documents in vectors. So I'm going to get a PDF reader. So this comes in from that Spring Boot starter that we selected from the beginning, that PDF um, uh, document. And so in this case, I wanna say I want a new paragraph, so paragraph PDF document viewer, and there's another one, so if I wanted PDF document reader, if I wanted to get a page, I can get a page in. I wanna split this up into finer green documents, so I want a paragraph at a time. Uh, if there's not a lot of information, you can just send a page at a time, but this uh, works for me. And again, I think there are some different uh, approaches to this on how you read in the documents, how you split them up. We're not gonna get into that in this video. Uh, we'll, we'll see if we could take a deeper dive into that and how some of the vector stores uh, are working behind the scenes and how we're searching them and filtering. But for this one, let's just worry about getting some data in there and using it in our application. So uh, I got a PDF reader. Now what I need to do is get a text splitter. So I'm gonna get a text splitter and we'll call this text splitter. This is equal to, not an emoji, Dan. This is equal to a new token text splitter. And then uh, what we need to do is take the vector store and basically apply these documents to it. So I'll say vector store dot uh, accept. So accept, we see that it takes a list of documents. So I don't have a list of documents yet, but what I can do is take that text splitter and apply whatever that PDF reader is giving me. So PDF reader .git, and that will give us those the breakdown of the PDF into paragraphs. So then I'm just gonna log something out. I'll say uh, info, 
uh, whoops, um, let's just say vector store, vector store loaded with data. All right, so that is it. That's our kind of ingestion service. And again, this would only happen once. I could do some checks here to make sure the database is not loaded. For our case, for this demo, uh, we're just gonna initialize a schema every time and load the data in it, because it's not a lot. But obviously in a real world application, you probably wouldn't do that. So let's go ahead and try to run this again. What we wanna see is that loaded is successfully happened. So we see a bunch of things going on. We see that text getting split up. Uh, so here are all the slides. Um, and then we go through and we process that. There is, you will see some of these, um, like if there's not particular fonts that you don't have for um, uh, different uh, PDFs, it may have some, some errors like this. This is just saying it can't read the font. Uh, if you wanna get rid of this, you can. Uh, if you open up application.properties, and let's just say I don't care about the logging for that, I can say logging.level. Um, this is the org.apache. Now again, the way I'm looking at this is org.apache, so pp font file system provider. Uh, so that's PDF box uh, PD model, and then the file, oops, sorry, font, and then the file system font provider. You could basically change the logging level for this to something like error, and we wouldn't see that. So the next time we do that, we won't. Um, but as we go through here, again, those are font issues. No big deal. And now we see splitting up documents into chunks, vector store loaded with data. So now if we go over to a vector store and take a look at this, we can see there's a bunch of information in there. So there's an ID, here's the content. So that should be by paragraph, some metadata about it. And then the actual embedding, this is that float. These are those floats that get stored in the vector database that I know nothing about, but uh, looks magical, but this is what helps that precision and that fast searching and filtering of getting that data out of the vector database, right? So part one is done. Uh, we, we have this data in the vector database. So now we should be able to perform a query and have it pull that data and uh, use that in the augmented prompt as we go ahead and ask the LM something. So the way that I'm going to uh, kind of demo that off is create a new REST controller. So let's call this the chat controller. And what we'll do is we'll mark this as a REST controller. We will uh, get a chat client. So again, if you're kind of new to Spring AI, this is how we have a chat client that is a portable chat client. So no matter what LM we're talking to, the code is the same. So I'll say private final chat client, chat client. Uh, we'll kind of get this through a constructor injection, but we'll get a, uh, the, we'll use the builder. So if you've ever used anything like the web client or the REST client, this should look familiar. So now what I can say is builder.build, and now we have a chat client. But at this point, it doesn't know anything about our document. So if we go ask the LM something, um, it's not gonna know about the documents that we're providing it. So let's take a look at this. So I'm gonna say uh, get mapping, uh, we'll do this on the root, and I'll say that I wanna return the response back, which is going to be a string, and we'll call this chat. So now I can use the um, chat client, so we gotta return that, uh, the chat client, and we're going to prompt that, and we're gonna pass in a user message, this is our query. I'll say, how did the Federal Reserve's recent interest rate cut impact various asset classes according to the analysis? Now, I, I'm not going to pretend to know anything about this. What I did is feed that document into something like Claude and say, you know, based on this document, uh, give me some interesting questions I can ask of it. So um, I'm gonna make a call to the LM and I'm going to get a string response back. So that's all there is to it. Now if we ask it, if we go ahead and send this request, 
we're going to get an answer that isn't exactly what we are looking for because what does recent mean? It doesn't really know, right? So it's going to go with recent based on all of its training data. And I won't bore you with that one, but um, if you look at it, it's not up to date with the data that we're trying to supply. Now, the way that we can supply it is by using a Spring AI, Spring AI advisor. So we can say, hey, a default advisor for this is what we call a new question and answer advisor. So you see we have some question and answer, uh, question and answer advisors here. And if we look at this, this is the context for the question uh, is retrieved from a vector store and added to the prompts user text. So it basically sets this up and says, hey, here's the context, here's the question, given the context and provided history, here's what we're going to uh, use. So this is how we do um, basically a similarity search against the vector database without having to write all of that logic. So all we're gonna do is pass in our vector store and we are good to go. Um, right, so I don't think I even need this, right? Right. So now, if we were to go ahead and run this, it's going to use that PDF as part of the context. But again, remember, it's not going to send the entire PDF, all oh, however many pages are in there. It's only going to send the relevant bits, and therefore, we're only sending the least amount of tokens we need to as part of that uh, query. So let's go ahead and run this application again. This time we shouldn't see all those errors because we turned that logging off for that font thing, so uh, that shouldn't show up. But again, it is reinitializing every single time, and this is just something that we're doing in a demo, something we wouldn't do uh, in a real application. You can always, you know, hey, do a quick search or a quick uh, query against the database and say, is there any records in there? If there are, hey, we don't need to initialize this again. Uh, we can we can just go with the data that's in there. And then this application starts up much faster every single time. So once this is started up, I'm going to make a request to localhost 8080. That is going to call this particular method. It's going to supply uh, this question. And because we have this default advisor, it's now sending that data along with it. So now I can go ahead and make a request uh, using a client. I'm using HTTP, uh, kind of like curl, but a little bit readable. So I can say, make a get request to localhost 8080. And let's see what happens. So again, it's retrieving that information, putting that in the context, sending it along. And based on that, um, here's what we can, here's, here's our analysis of that. So duration and yield curves, uh, high yield and investment grade bonds, equities, French equity exposure, uh, et cetera. So using that document, it was able to come up with a better answer with information that is relevant. We're asking a question about the current economy, right? So it was able to use new relevant information instead of the information that it was trained on. So I think that was just a kind of a really good example of uh, being able to provide your own documents. And again, this was a single document. You may have tons and tons of documents and a lot more information that you want to store in a vector database. Uh, but again, that ingestion phase makes this really easy to do. Um, I thought this was a pretty good example. Hopefully you did too. All right, so that's it. That was our example of getting started with RAG in Java. Uh, using Spring AI. Spring AI makes this really easy with all of the document readers, being able to read in those documents, uh, store those in a vector database. Spring AI has support for all of the major vector databases out there. Again, you can look in the documentation for that. And really the portability is the key. Underneath the hood, we have a query language uh, that is able to talk to uh, the different vector databases out there. And it's a single kind of abstraction uh, which, if you ask the Spring AI team, was not easy to put together. So we're very, very thankful for them for all of their hard work on that. So we get our data into the database, and now we can go ahead and use that as context in our queries to the large language models. So that was a lot of fun. Next steps. What do we, you know, again, we just kind of touched on a couple things here. One of the next steps is, again, we're using this in a lot of different business AI applications out there. And some of the concerns we hear often is, okay, this is great, but I don't know if I want to be sending all of my private documents, my internal documentation, 
off to these public LLMs because I'm not sure what they're doing with this data. Maybe they're using it and training on it. And I don't know if I want to send that data off. Perfectly uh, understandable fear to have there. So next steps with this is you can go ahead and use something like Spring AI with something like Olama, which allows you to run open source models uh, on your local machine, on a server somewhere, and talk to that instead of sending this information out to one of the larger uh, large language models out there. So I have some videos on Olama and getting started with that, but we'll kind of follow this up with that. I think it'll be a good example of doing RAG without sending your information out there. Uh, so if you're interested in that, let me know in the comments below and we'll get to that shortly. But friends, you know what time it is. I hope you learned a lot today. And if you did, please do me a big favor, leave me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and as always, happy coding. Thank you.